Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you speak to us through your word. And we're here together this morning to hear what you've got to say for us so that we might grow more like you and serve you in the days ahead. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. During the Second World War, the British Army was led by Field Marshal Montgomery. Some of you will remember, and some of you will have read about it or heard about it. He was affectionately known as Monty, and we all recognized him wearing his berry and his battle dress. Well, one day, Monty was asked this question. I wonder what answer you would have given. Who, in your opinion, was the greatest leader in history? Thinking they might get an answer like Alexander the Great, Nelson, something like that. But quick as a flash, Monty said, Moses. Interesting, isn't it? And that's the person we're going to be thinking about. We read a lot about Moses in the Bible. And some of us know quite a bit about him already. Okay, just for a minute or two, let's find out what we know. This is true and false. It's just a bit of fun, this bit, really. <laughs> True or false, Moses was born in the bulrushes. False. He was... There's something to do with bulrushes, isn't there? He was hidden in the bulrushes, wasn't he? He wasn't born in the bulrushes, as far as we know. Okay. He led the people through the Dead Sea. False. It was the... Red Sea. Okay? How many people did he lead? A hundred? A thousand? A million? Hands up for a hundred. Hands up for a thousand. Hands up for a million. Yes, estimated at 1.2 million people. Staggering, isn't it? Staggering. <clears throat> Amazing. Moses is written about in 25 of the 39 books of the Bible. So he's a key person when we read the scriptures. There's a lot to learn from his life. What does God call him? When God speaks of Moses, he says, Moses, my servant. That was God's title for him. Moses, my servant, the humblest man in the whole earth. So, he's certainly someone worth thinking about, whose life is worth looking at, and it's through his life that God will speak to us in these weeks to come as we begin this series about him. So where do we start? Well, we start at the beginning, of course. His early years. And he had a, a, a wonderful start, when you think about it. The uh, Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt. They grew in great numbers. And so Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, said, OK, we've got to stop this. There'll be too many of them and not enough of us. So we'll start killing the babies. And so it was when Moses was born that his mother uh, hid him in the bulrushes and uh, charged his sister with keeping watch. And then, uh, well, you know what happened next? Probably you remember. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, comes to bathe in the river and she discovers Moses in the bulrushes and says, oh, I oh, can't let him die. I'll take him as my son. And so he ends up having a godly mother and an education and the life of the palace. 
So he has really what we might call a privileged start in life, doesn't he? And that's where we find him uh, at this time that we're going to look at this morning. This was all preparation for what was to come, because that's the, what we're thinking about this morning, the preparation of the servant of God. Come on, Terry, it's your turn to come and read to us now. What happened next when he grew up to be a man? The reading this morning is taken from Exodus 2, verses 11 to 15, and Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6, and they can be found on page 51 at the front of the Bibles. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his king's folk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, the preparation of the servant of God. And there are three things for us to notice in this preparation. And the first is that um, Moses had to learn a sense of sin. A sense of sin. Is that coming? (laughs) Well, I'll carry on and um, appear maybe. And it's true to say he had to learn the hard way. He had to learn the hard way. Because he goes out one day and he sees these two fellows fighting. One is an Egyptian and one is a Hebrew. And he intervenes and kills the Egyptian and hides him in sand. And he thinks that no one has seen it. And he thinks he can get away with it. He sees this sort of thing happening in the palace, I expect. Life was cheap. And he thought he could get away with it. Then the next day, he goes out and he sees two Hebrews fighting. And he seeks to intervene a bit again. And they say, hey, come on. Are you going to do to us what you did to that fellow yesterday? And, of course, he realizes his wrongdoing is known. And he's scared because he knows what Pharaoh's character is like, that he's likely to be killed, and so he runs away. Who 
who has been molding his life? Is the center of his life him, himself, until now? And so he runs away to a lonely place where he can get away from everybody and anything. He needs to learn a sense of sin in order to serve the Lord. And as he would look back on this, he would realize that it was all preparation for knowing God and serving God. And perhaps it challenges us to have a renewed sense of sin in as we um, consider Moses' life. Perhaps it speaks to us. A sense of sin and of unworthiness. And so he runs to a deserted place, the desert, the wilderness. And this is the second part of his preparation, really, because now he has time to stop and think. Time to stop and think. And the Bible tells us that he goes to the backside of the desert. And he ends up looking after sheep, wandering about day after day, trying to find food for the sheep in a desert. I've recently had the privilege of going to Jordan and seeing the desert and the wilderness there. And you can't see a blade of grass anywhere. So for him to be looking after sheep in a desert was a hard job. And he would be wandering around. But it did give him a chance to slow down. A time to stop and think about his life. Not only in the desert, but the backside of the desert. Really hidden away. Time to think, time to discern what's important in life. How could he know that? It was good preparation for Moses. And does it not remind us that in our lives there needs to be time to stop and think for what God is preparing us to do. It may not be the same thing that you did years ago. It may be something different. So that was the second part of the preparation. And then the third part of the preparation he had, he needed to have a sensitivity to the Lord. And that happened when the bush started to burn. Out there in the desert, barren, a bush or a tree stands out anyway, but a burning one even more. And not only did it stand out, but it drew his attention because he went to have a look at it. And it was that bush that was to uh, bring about a listening ear because it was from this bush that God would speak to him. And out of his rut, God would lead him. The rut of wandering day after day after day with the sheep. I read of a story about Australia where people, when it's a rainy season, it gets terribly muddy. But 
in the dry season, season of course, the, um, the muddy roads become full of dry ruts. And someone put up a notice, choose your rut carefully because you will be in it for the next 30 miles. And uh, maybe <laughs> that could speak of, uh, of us in some way. It certainly can for some people who would say, well, I've got a good job, I've got a house, I'm married, I've got a family, I've got a comfortable lifestyle, I've had promotion, we go on lots of holidays, and um, yes, uh, this is how it'll be until I retire. And they've got it all mapped out for the next, I don't know how many years. I'm over 40. I don't expect anything to change now. What they're really saying, I don't expect God to be speaking now, to be challenging now. So this was Moses. He had to have a sensitivity towards the Lord. And this was a wake-up call spiritually for him. Because as he comes to the bush, what's the first thing he hears? His name. His name. Moses. Moses. That must have been a surprise, wasn't it? Whoever was speaking didn't say, Oi, you. No. Here is someone who knows his name. And then the second thing he's told to do is to tell him to take his shoes off, his sandals off, because the ground is holy. If the ground is holy, then who is there? Well, God himself. And here God declares himself, doesn't he? I am the God of your father, your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Maybe it's time for us to take our shoes off. <laughs> uh, and listen to what God wants to say to us. Here was God preparing Moses with a sense of sin, time to stop and think, a sensitivity to the voice of the Lord for all that he'd got for Moses in future days. So perhaps it causes us to say, Lord, where do you want me to be? Not just in our daily job, but in our work in the church, for instance. Or elsewhere. Do we really expect God to be involved in our lives? This is what Moses came to realize, didn't he, in the desert? As he listened to his voice, watched for his touch, and knew it was the Lord. And that needs to be our experience, doesn't it? To allow him to prepare us for future service. God called Moses to be a servant of the Lord, and he calls us to be his servants today. So what is he preparing us for? What does he want us to do? So may he help us to listen to his voice, to know his touch, to know it's him speaking to us, because that's what he wants to do to get our shoes off and realize we're standing on holy ground because God is for us and we're precious to him and he looks to us.
so that he might change us and make us who he wants us to be and use us in his service. The preparation of a servant of the Lord. Are we willing? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you called Moses to be your servant. Help us as you call us to be present-day servants for you, to be willing and trusting and obedient to you. So may our lives glorify you and may we be doing those things that please you for the extension of your kingdom and for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father God, thank you that you meet us when we are least expecting you. Help us to notice the signs that you are trying to attract our attention and to listen carefully to when you call us by name. To notice where you are guiding us. Thank you that those you call, you equip. Help us to remember that we are able to do more than we hope or imagine when we allow ourselves to be strengthened by your spirit. Help us all and show us how to serve your majesty in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you are called the Prince of Peace. There is much conflict and unrest in our world. We pray for Ukraine, Afghanistan, Myanmar, Yemen, and all the areas where there is violence and war. We ask that you will inspire those who are in positions of leadership or power to think again. We ask that routes to reconciliation and laying down of arms become clear. Pour your love into these troubled places that your peace may reign. We pray for a safe present and a safe future for all people displaced from their homes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, these last few years have been times of such change with Brexit, the pandemic, the conflict in Europe and the, co the cost of living crisis. Many families and individuals feel very unsettled. We ask that people feel your presence strongly. Show us how to encourage people into our churches and show us how to journey together, deepening and enriching our relationship with you. We pray for Rachel and Jordan and all of our leadership team here at St. Peter's. We pray for all the local churches in Rushton and for your wider church around the world. We ask for strength and support for our mission partners, Lee and Petra, and your guidance in their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you now all those we know of personally who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for the sick and those recovering from surgery. We pray for the bereaved and the lonely. We pray for the troubled and distressed. In a moment of quiet, we silently name now those we would particularly like to bring before the Lord today. Father God, strengthen and uplift those named and surround them with your loving care and protection, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, almighty Lord and creator, your beautiful world is coming alive once again with spring flowers and the leaves are opening on the trees. 
We thank you for the beauty that surrounds us and ask that you will open our eyes to the good things of this world. Help us to see you in the glory of creation and in the love that we show to one another. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And joining all of our prayers and praises into one as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <laughs>